Let's go ahead and do roll call, uh, Wendy. Oh, and a couple more staff joining us. Nancy Hendrickson. Steve Fancher. Here. Oh, Nancy's coming. I can let people in while you take roll call if you want, Wendy, so you don't have to try to do both. It's hard for me to do the both at the same time. So let's see. Saw that Nancy just joined us. Eric Mueller. Here. Dave Ripma. Let me see Dave. Seth Reeser. Did not see Seth. Shirley Craddock. Present. Lori Stegman is not present. Ken Anderton, not present. Corky Collier. Here. James Allison. Present. Mary Helen Kincaid. She's joining us. I just I just let her in, so she may still be getting settled. Tanny Staffinson. Here. Eric Molander. See you, Eric. Ed Washington, not present. Bob Salinger. Heather King. Nine members present, actually. Nancy Thank Hendrickson you. is here. Got Thank you, Nancy. you all for Thank you. Okay. Thank you all for I thought you were applauding day. the nine members, Nancy. I, didn't, oh. I couldn't tell if you were marking well, present or just applauding and, the group. And I think I joined after you went through people. So we, we saw you coming in, Mary Helen. Wendy's got you. Thanks. You saw me arriving. <laughs> I let you in the door, and then Wendy marks you present. That's the deal. OK. Well, welcome, everybody. We're probably at a quorum now, I believe. Um, before we get started with our business of the day, I do want to just say something. Uh, I want to acknowledge the great leadership and service uh, from Shirley Craddock, who this is one of her last meetings on our board. Um, Shirley, you've been around uh, for a long time on this, this endeavor, so uh, I know you've like I said, provided great leadership. We're very thankful for um, your representation and what you've done. Uh, obviously, everything else you've done for Metro City of Gresham elsewhere, but, but on this board particularly. So thank you very much. Mr. Chair, do you want to share the information in that email that I sent with you this morning? I was going to bring that up and I was going to pass it to you, Jim. Um, but um, uh, we have a little to... bit of celebrating to do. I'm looking to see who's on. Is Colin or, or Evan? Why don't you go for it? Why don't you talk about the news we received this morning via email before dawn, if you're willing? She may be in the midst of a kid or something else. No, I'm here. Thank you. I was just trying to get the mute button. Um, yeah, so I think the, the news that Jim is talking about is um, you know, that this morning uh, Congress passed the uh, Water Resources and Development Act 2022, and um, our bill, our our which is this is a really big uh, advancement, and so um, you know it's we still have lots and lots of great work to do, but this gives us the ability to do the work, and um, it's a really exciting uh, step forward. We also, in the last few weeks, have uh, seen money trickling from the federal government down to the Army Corps here in Portland, and so they've been able to kind of start the scoping process of the, the design phase with us. So we're, we're on a really good um, trajectory with the project and making forward progress. And um, it's, you know, a great win. And we can all thank uh, Congressman DeFazio for his very helpful efforts as he's on his way out the door, as well as uh, Senator Merkley, Senator Wyden, and Congressman Blumenauer, who will continue to be wonderful champions for us in this work. Colin, I do think Colin is on the call. Would you like to add anything, Colin? 
No, no, it's uh, it's really exciting news, and I think it's from uh, all of the organizations and groups that you all represent um, that have been advocating for this and working for it. Uh, so thanks to you and your organizations, um, uh, a lot of letters of support. Um, and again, this is for uh, the inclusion in the Water Resources Development Act of 2022 is a construction authorization. Uh, we'll need to get annual appropriations for, from it, but it's definitely, um, it's an act of Congress that this uh, should be constructed. And so it's really strong. Um, direction uh, to appropriate those funds annually so that we can do the design and construction in the years to come. So it's really exciting uh, milestone. Thanks all. Two other small things for you all. We were one of five um, water projects authorized in the act. And um, I think the, the other piece of it is that when I was back in DC last week, we were recognized by the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works as um, being among the best local project sponsors. So um, again, that is a testimony to all the local jurisdictions and partners coming together and continuing to support the project. So just to really punctuate that point, wouldn't happen without the community support. Thank you. On to appropriations. Get another. Sorry, Steve. Yet, yet another obstacle is appropriations, but we'll also get through that one. So request, which I hope is a small request. Um, would you be able to send to everyone on the board like a little announcement? I'd like to not get all the details wrong when I uh, pass that on to uh, my organization. <laughs> we will absolutely do that. Thanks, Nancy. Great suggestion, Nancy. All right, moving on to our um, discussion today. Uh, you know that we've been just starting the discussion around operating revenue development and plan to use this a good chunk of the time today to open it up and have continued discussions. I'm going to turn it over to Sarah O'Brien to give us more um, kind of the background again, uh, step us through the timelines um, that we're anticipating for this. Sarah? Mr. Chair, we have a two Sarah show prepared for you today here. So if you get tired of one Sarah, you can call on the other one and then you can always switch back if you need to. Can you all see my, my screen that starts with today at the top? Yes, we can. So I'm gonna give a little extended intro here today. I think we do wanna have the bulk of the meeting and the conversation focused on a continuation of the last meeting's conversation. Uh, but the staff have been doing some really cool work on just sort of process design and mapping out the decision paths and, and issues you have in front of you going forward. So I'm gonna share a little bit of that. Um, Sarah Rich from Echo Northwest has brought her slides from last time, as well as kind of a high level summary of what we heard from you last time and kind of, you know, where that information is heading. And it's not going to be a laundry list of every single question and comment from last time, but a high level synthesis. Sarah will share that to reorient you and us, and then um, we'll kind of open it up. She'll have her slides, as I said, from last time, including the ones that we didn't get to, um, and happy to dive into and continue to flag issues for offline or online discussion either way. So I'm going to walk us through this first section of kind of a big picture reminder of where we are, and then a little bit of a deeper dive into operating revenue next steps uh, than we've gotten so far. Jim? Sarah, do you want to address chat feature? Did we do that? I will do that next. All right, thanks. Thank you. Um, I put my housekeeping after my intro slide, big mistake. Um, thanks for the reminder though. Um, so that you all can have some visibility of what conversations to expect here and what over the next couple of months and what decisions to expect coming um, down, down the pike over the next several months. Um, and then I'm going to share with you just some little facilitation kind of insider tools and tricks of the trade that I think might be useful for us to have a shared understanding of as we operate through the next couple of months here because we do just have a really complex uh, set of conversations to have with all these interwoven topics. So I'm going to talk through that just for a little while and hopefully right about the time that you're getting sick of hearing me talk about process, then I'll hand it over to Sarah. Um, 
to give us that recap from last time and then and then dive back into discussion. Um, a housekeeping request quickly from staff. Some of you may have already noticed that your chat is working differently than it used to be. Um, we have both kind of inclusivity and public records requests around using the chat as actively as we have. And I've, I've encouraged that, so I'm not scolding anyone here. Uh, it can be a really helpful way to lead a discussion, but it also can make it difficult for folks to track on multiple channels and it does cause some public records um, issues. And so uh, I believe Wendy has partially enabled chat so that you can contact me or Wendy directly with sort of technical issues or or flags. You can still raise your hand. You can still show your emotions through emojis. You can still do most of the usual stuff. But to make sure that we keep our public records clean, we're going to ask folks to keep um, sort of content questions and statements out of the chat. That increases the likelihood that we'll actually get your feedback and send it to the appropriate location in the long run, too. A fun fact is human brains can't actually multitask. We think we can, and humans reliably overstate their ability to multitask. Um, but we can't. We just flick back and forth as quickly as we can, and it's usually not very quickly. So it'll probably benefit us all. Uh, also, uh, I think folks are already doing this pretty well, but please try to stay muted if you're not talking um, so that we don't catch your background noise too much. That's our little housekeeping. I used to tell people where the emergency exits were, but I don't get to do that anymore. So we're going to talk about chat instead. So where you are and where you're headed, many of you, all of you, hopefully will remember this roadmap graphic we've been running off for a long time. And it was pretty high level, right? I keep showing you this and saying, oh, you're right here between the fall information sessions and the spring summer decisions. Uh, you're in this region here. And a lot of what the staff wanted to communicate with this sort of early graphic was, hey, you've got kind of a, a turning point here in the summer. And then a lot of the conversations that a lot of us would love to be having right now around budgets and program development and strategic direction that's pretty far off in the future. So we've been operating from this high level graphic for quite a while. I want to congratulate the staff because there is a ton of work behind this one. We'll include this, of course, um, in the, we'll send out the presentation afterwards. We thought it'd be more confusing to send it off in advance. I'm going to give you a real high level look at this now, and then we'll send it off in the packet and we'll discuss it in much greater detail over the next couple of sessions here. Um, but the main thing I want to point out is that the staff is starting to sort of build out this transition process enough that we can be able to see these, I'm pointing at my own screen, these streams of work. We're in really focused on this operating revenue one right now, and we've got a set of, of milestones ahead of us that we've already discussed to some extent leading up to a vote on an ordinance and rate resolution that we expect to come sometime late next spring or summer. But a lot of you have already been thinking ahead to the green or even the purple portions of this. And we want to make sure we, that we recognize that and also that we start the work early. And I know the staff are planning to um, dig into a, a beginnings of a geo bond conversation at our next meeting. And some of you have been engaging with um, Jamie Damon, who's been working her way through contacting all of you uh, from Kearns and West to start talking about sort of the beginning of the nuts and bolts of the geo bond process. So these things are going to be running in parallel for a while. We're going to still have our focus up here in operating uh, revenue and the board adjustments to the operating revenue structure development proposal that we we saw last time for the next for today's meeting. And we'll come back to that in January. But you're going to start seeing more and more of this geo bond content and we'll start addressing and bringing back some of the questions and concerns that you flagged about that process up to that time. Um, and council has also been helping us start to start to map out, and I know the staff are working on this internally as well, the longer term conversations about the sort of technical nuts and bolts of dissolution. So I think we can use this to orient ourselves going forward. I think it will be much more useful in the long run um, in helping us kind of track our progress than our roadmap graphic. Um, and we'll try to just bring this up at the beginning of the meeting and say, we're up here or we're down here or we thought we'd be here, but we're a little behind. So let's catch up and see if that helps us keep a little bit more oriented. So we will, as I said, send this off. This is a little messier, deeper one, but because we're focusing on operating revenue today, I want to test out using this just for our next several operating revenue focused discussions. And again, this is something that staff developed partially for their own work planning and sort of coordination and, and also to help communicate just kind of where, where we are in this process. Um, 
we have been working through a pre preliminary revenue forecast and rate analysis. And we're mostly, I think, now in this dark blue box here, board input and adjustments. We're asking you for political advice. We're asking you for pragmatic advice. We're asking you for your technical and legal questions about whether, when, and how this stuff can be implemented. And all of this is headed towards an adjusted forecast and rate analysis that we'll be working on into January. The plan, as we'll describe in some detail later on, is for us to collect all your feedback, collect feedback from the technical advisory group, and then come back with a set of proposed changes to you that before we ask the Echo Northwest team to rerun a rate analysis with a new system, they'll come back in January and say, hey, this is what we think we're changing based on what we've heard from you so far. Maybe they'll say, hey, we, we can't technically stand behind this kind of change. And so we're recommending this instead based on your feedback and our understanding of the technical and legal um, constraints here. But that's where we're headed next. And our goal is to land in about March with a director's recommendation uh, based on that second rate analysis run. You are the board, right? You're the decision makers. And at the end of the day, sometime in the spring or summer, you're going to need to vote on the resulting ordinance and resolution. And again, we're just in the operating revenue box here in that in that channel of work. Um, and so you will have an opportunity to, you know, provide your feedback or, or amendments to that because you have to vote on it at the end of the day. And we recognize that, you know, we may not get it perfect the second time, but we're going to try really hard to have it as close to perfect or as close to optimized uh, with a second draft here as we possibly can. Um, if needed, um, there's an opportunity to, to have a second look at the rate impacts that was re would result from that before the draft. And I also want to flag because so many of our questions and concerns have been around um, the billing and collection costs uh, and, and revenue loss due to collection challenges um, that I know staff are already working directly with municipal governments that are involved in this group. Um, to, to talk about a better billing and collection solution. Uh, I think I, we've heard unanimously probably from the board and the staff at this point that the operating assumptions that we had to sort of base, base that first forecast on, you know, they were painful beyond belief and, and not really realistic. And so everybody's working together that has sort of a municipal role in this effort to try to find a better solution that can be implemented here. So that's really got to run in parallel, but I know Jim and the staff wanted to reassure you that those, those of you that aren't in those conversations, that they are in process and everybody's working hard to get that solved. So all this comes together and then we start to, to head into those transitional points um, with the, uh, the call for dissolution, the call for a transition to the elected board and those appointments that were kind of reflected on the other graphic. I'm going to take a quick pause here. I'm going to say you'll have plenty of time to review this and ask questions and provide feedback, but are there any quick notes or comments, any quick questions before I dive into the sort of next level of detail here? Uh, Nancy, you unmuted, so I'm going to call on you, and then Eric Mueller has his hand up, so I'll call on Eric next. Nancy, go ahead. Okay. Okay. I just want to. Um, so uh, what I'm hearing is that we want to get. We're starting to work. We just saw the numbers. We're starting to work through this. We have two meetings a week, month. Oh, when dear, it, that's Nancy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's December, so we are going to have six meetings between now and March when we want to have this done. So I'm just pointing that out because that. I know that we have a timeline and I don't know it's important to meet that, but that signals to me, okay, I can't, I need to just focus on major issues and not small issues because um, like I'll never get through, we'll never get through it all as a group. So I'm just, I, I want to clarify real that quick, observation. and I want to give Jim a chance to respond to that if he wishes to, but I want to clarify that, that the tenant, first of all, that this timeline is really tenant. This is, this is the goal, right? That, that we feel like making regular progress over the next couple of months can land us. And when I said March, that's when I think, Jim, you'd like to have a director's recommendation to share with the board. You're not asking for a vote in March. So that gives us, you're right, six months before our timeline shows a vote. Jim, I don't know if you want to comment on the hard, hardness of that deadline, but my understanding is this is not hard and fast, but this is what we need to be able to get to a May 2024 election uh, guess, dissolution timeline. Thank you, sir. What I want to say is, board, a majority of you can make a decision to do what you want to do, and our objective is to make sure you have sufficient information to feel confident in voting whatever direction you want to vote. 
And so if it requires more time, we can take it. The countervailing stress on that is we're running out of money and we really need to keep moving on the capital program. So it, it's really just those two stress points that we're trying to manage. And I think the last piece that just bears repeating is that there are future boards that are gonna be making more detailed decisions. And what we really need from the initial board is the method of funding, right? And, and that the program development and so on that I know many of you are really interested in, and I am as well, really has to happen down the road a bit. You guys can put some structure around that, but um, the details really need to be worked out later. And I, I just wanna stress that we are running out of money um, under the current system. And we really do need to get moving on the capital investments to keep the community safe and to maintain uh, our accreditation under the flood insurance program. So, Thanks, Jim. I'm going to call on Eric. Let's see, am I unmuted? I guess I am. You're okay. unmuted. All right. Well, uh, and it doesn't have to be addressed today uh, because I think you made mention that we were going to be revisiting this along the way. But on this slide, it, it brings to mind a question I had as I was trying to understand some of the timing of how, how we start the revenue collection that we're required to do before we can call for the election of the permanent board and how we do that and not end up there being an overlap where the new water quality district is billing and charging folks and the legacy districts are still in operation because we haven't gotten to the dissolution. And I guess I'm confused as to maybe how that, uh, how we align that because of course people aren't gonna be happy about getting charged by the new district. They'll be doubly unhappy if we're we're charging, charging them, them both out of the left pocket and the right pocket. They might well notice. I'm going to ask, thanks, Eric, for the question. I'm going to ask um, Hong, since she came on camera, if there's maybe a short answer to that question that we could dig in in greater detail at a future meeting, just because I want to bring us to operating revenue before long here. But I, I suspect you have a pretty quick answer that, that could run us for now, Hong. I do. The, the first is that it's not allowed in the law to be double charging uh, the, the landowners. Um, between the two districts. Second, the practical mechanism to answer your question, Eric, is through the development of the uh, dissolution plan and the resolutions and the timing of when certain boards are, are, are going to take effect and when they uh, dial back. So that will be part of the dissolution uh, negotiation uh, that can be had between the urban district and, and the legacy district, legacy districts. Thanks, Hong. That's really helpful. And we will dive into that, Eric, I think, in much more detail as we get closer to that purple stream of work. I'm going to call on Mary, Helen, and then Steve, and then I want to drive us back to operating revenue fairly quickly here. So if you have an urgent question, do put your hand up and I'll call on you after Steve. But otherwise, I'm going to take Mary, Helen, and then Steve here and then move on. Um, I know this is changing as of this morning or noon when we got on the call and learned that we were in the appropriations bill. So my question is, is does that change the financial fo forecast of what the geo bond amount to be or, and if that can come later, that's fine. But um, it sounds like somebody else is giving us money and just found out about it today, but we don't know how much. And I don't know the timeline of when that money would arrive and how it would affect what we might choose to charge customers. So however that works out, looks, it's like every time somebody gives us money and we put it in our bag, how does it affect what we're proposing to charge people? Jim, I bet you have a quick answer to that yeah. question. Well, first of all, Mary Helen, we didn't get an appropriation. We got an authorization and you have to have an authorization to ask for money. So now we have permission to ask Congress for money. So we don't have new money, but the authorization is aimed at ultimately winning appropriations of approximately $104, $105 million in federal investment. But that requires, that's only to fund the Corps of Engineers to do the construction work for us. And we have to provide a local match for that. So the revenue that is potentially allowed through this authorization has been contemplated in our work plan all along. Okay, no so this, is, this is money you've been planning on and the rest of our conversation is how do we build the, the local match and the other parts of right the work it's that like we need to do. let's just say it keeps going on the really exciting they're going to give us money and they're going to give us what we asked for 
you know, is Pollyanna of me in dealing with the government and the new Congress. But all of that said, um, is there a way to um, include in the description of revenue need? And I, I guess I misspoke because I understood that it was for the FEMA project, but um, how that relates to why we want to collect money from people, because I would imagine this will be discussed publicly in the papers, et cetera, at some point in time. And those kinds of answers, um, I, I would need answers to those kinds of things so that I could respond properly to the land yeah. owners in my district. Yeah, so to your neighbor's think, questions. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Jim. The easiest way to think of it is that um, the revenue we're going to get from the federal government is capital money. So we're going to improve and build capital assets into our system. And the money we're going to charge people locally is to take care of those capital assets once they've been constructed, will allow us to maintain and replace them as they age. So the operating revenue covers the maintenance and replacement and the capital dollars coming from the feds and our GO bond that you see in the green slide here provide the capital dollars. So the monthly charges that we're talking about today on operating are to fund the operations and maintenance of the capital program that is funded by the feds and the bond. I hope that wasn't too confusing. But Mary Helen, I think to your point, this is, this is we'll be coming back to the financial forecast conversation at the next meeting, right? And I think part of what I'm hearing from you, Mary Helen, is like needing some talking points around the way these different flavors of money come together in our layer cake that we talked about a million years ago. And so I think we can commit to some clearer communications around that if that'll help you in your messaging. And, and I might ask that it be put in Mary Helen's speak terms um, so that I can communicate that to the neighbors because acronyms and capital bond might be way beyond even my most educated neighbor. So that, okay, that, you know, I, I, bet, I bet Evan and Astor are putting this on their list now as well. So I, I appreciate it and, and we'll make sure that we, we may not get you that language at the next meeting, Mary Helen. No, no um, but, I, but I've, the, it, the need is there. Yeah, I've heard this for eight years. I mean, I've heard a lot of these terms for eight years. Some people haven't heard it at all. So anyway, yeah. thank you. Yeah. We'll put it in English. Thank you, Steve. Um, and I apologize if we've talked about this in months or years past, but um, speaking of running out of money, the district's kind of running out of money. I could envision, one could envision kind of a stopgap funding measure potentially that doesn't fully fund the district. And how does that, are we thinking about that? I mean, is, is there potential for um, that, that, and how does that interplay with then the dissolution? Because we've said things like, well, once the first dollar starts rolling in, we we, we dissolve the, the old districts and we create this new, district, but I, I can envision a, a scenario where that's not true. Like we we actually bring in some some revenue that's really visioned to be part of the long-term district and maybe one of the tools of the the revenue cake, but it's not all of it. Um, and we continue charging uh, with assessments, not double charging, but maybe the new money's coming in from a different source. So um, is that on our we, radar I think we may want to flag that as part of our, our conversation with Sarah today, too. But it looks like Hong or Jim may have a response as well. So I think those are excellent questions, Steve. And it goes to the sort of the timing and the sequence of what it is that we are um, we are approving in this budget and when and how are we collecting that? And so we can, once there's an agreement for collection, we can work with the municipality to limit the collection, let's say for just those outside of the floodplain, knowing that perhaps at the time we do our first collection uh, that we've already assessed um, within the floodplain. So those sequences will need to be played out. I don't think that, that we are there yet in terms of talking about the details and sequencing that, but certainly it will be part of something that we have to, to develop uh, a, a framework for. So Steve, Maybe, I'm gonna, oh, Jar, one, sorry. One of the key Jim. technical issues is that, again, the urban district does not have authority to use the current assessment approach. So um, again, there's some potential ways that we could navigate through that. Uh, but we'd have to determine that there's a, a good justification for only going with a partial billing. And there may be one, Steve, there really may be one uh, to take a little more time to, to resolve the 
full district charge and the nexus and so on. Steve, I'm going to put this in our, our bucket of sort of technical slash pragmatic questions for the, the conversation with Echo 2. And I don't know if we'll want to dig into that today, but certainly um, in terms of the, the work ahead of us. I want to remind folks as we move forward here, we have a lot of complex conversations going on and relatively few board decisions. And as I just want to take a moment to reorient here, and I think this really will get at the meat of our conversation with Sarah today and over the next couple of sessions. There are a bunch of areas that the staff really just need your help and input on this operating revenue work as it goes forward. Uh, we will return in our executive session on December 19th to this question of the guiding principles. Help we'd like, the staff would like your help in potentially revising that and getting the full board ready to use that to help guide decisions. Um, we have flagged the need and the staff and, and you all and your colleagues are working on a better approach to billing and collections that gets us better collections outcomes at a, at a lower price tag. That's definitely been flagged as a priority and is already in progress. Um, and the work that we've been going through the last couple of weeks here is really aimed at trying to get us a sense of, you know, what's the ballpark estimated revenue from Lori's forecast that we need for big categories of activities so we can wrap, map out a revenue solution that gets us as close as possible to meeting those needs um, of the different flavors and with the different bases and nexus, nexus and proportionality issues that we discussed last time. We need your help in thinking through that and fact checking and ground truthing and also just telling us about the sort of political and pragmatic realities that might affect us. We have technical constraints, we have legal constraints, we don't have a wide open place playing field in terms of either sort of costs, benefits, or um, the way that we collect revenue going forward. Um, but we're asking for a reality check here. And the conversation of last last week's board meeting, last, I don't know when it was, last month's board meeting, um, really got us a lot to work through there, as Sarah will describe when she presents some of the results here later today. Um, so we're asking that on both the cost and benefit on the program side and also on the revenue side. So in particular, what we started diving into in detail last time was what are the political and the pragmatic implications of, of some of these proposed allocations. And we got some clear feedback from you guys about some sticker shock, about some concerns about the, uh, you know, sort of straw man uh, proposal that the Echo Northwest team brought us last time, especially around the way that those costs, the revenue needs are allocated across geographies and customer types and how that will be perceived in your neighborhoods, in your communities, in your interest groups, in your political decision-making bodies. Um, and helping us figure out how how to optimize that revenue approach given the technical and legal and political pragmatic constraints that we face. So these are the conversations we started last time and we're continuing today, right? Um, and the big equity question, which I remember uh, Shirley raised towards the end of our last conversation was, how do we balance the need for sustainability for the district, fairness for folks who are already paying part of the bill, and affordability for low-income families and small businesses? Because there are kind of only so many ways you can stretch this revenue in so many different directions in order to make sure that you're managing affordability, fairness, equity, and, and financial sustainability. And so that is one of the things that we are asking and will continue to ask for your feedback on. It is probably at the next phase of developing um, this revenue model, revenue structure that um, at the Echo Northwest team will bring us quite a bit more detailed information on what are some of the technical tools we have at our disposal to manage these affordability and, and progressive structure concerns. You have relatively few decisions to make in the midst of all this stuff that we're talking through, right? You have an opportunity to adopt at some point formally um, a guiding principles document if you choose to do that. You will have an opportunity to approve uh, billing and collection agreements, whatever shape that might take in the future. Um, you will have uh, an opportunity and, and I suppose in some sense a responsibility to adopt a, a revenue structure ordinance and rate resolution that we just described. You know, we're on a target to have that conversation leading up to a vote over the summer. That happens at the board's discretion and direction. Then we need to try to build you something we can vote, you can vote for. Um, and we recognize that and that's the work that we're doing right now. 
Um, and then down the road, there will be an opportunity for a more detailed budget conversation. I know because I'm somebody who manages budgets day in and day out, and I know many of you are too, there's a tendency to treat any, any conversation we have like it's a budget discussion. This is a big buckets of revenue discussion we've been having, but you will have a year one budget discussion in front of you at some point that you can actually use the revenue structure that you've hopefully adopted by that point um, to, to be able to actually determine spending, which is where a lot of us who work at the municipal or even the nonprofit level tend to think. This is kind of the big one, right? There's there's this revenue and, and rate resolution uh, vote coming at you sometime, hopefully next year, um, that I wanna just kind of daylight the fact that, that we know that that looks like a vote. Um, you have bylaws, we live in a democracy, we know what a majority vote looks like. Uh, but I know the staff's intent is to build a, build a revenue approach here that, um, can get as close to a consensus agreement of this group as possible. And so I wanna talk just briefly, um, if you will indulge me for just a few more slides here about what that might look like, because a lot of times we have these kind of big collaborative discussions and people start getting in this mood of like, well, maybe this is gonna be a consensus decision even though I know there's a vote coming. And then one day we come in here and we do a majority vote and it wins or loses and everybody's like, wait a second, I thought we were a community here. I thought we were having a collaborative governance conversation. And that can be really upsetting and I think it's an important thing to plan for ahead of time. We want to bring you a consensus worthy document, a consensus worthy ordinance and rate rate resolution that everybody can feel good about implementing, uh, regardless of whether or how you vote for it. Uh, we need a lot of you to help us implement it. And I'm a facilitator, and sometimes that just means standing up at the front of the room and making sure I call on people in order. But facilitation actually means making things easier. Um, so I wanna talk about some of the decisions that we have in front of you and, and how we can make those easier, how we can foster these conversations in a way that heads you into a productive decision space. In my experience, when a group like this, where people are here to represent diverse interests and your job is to sit here both as a governing board and as someone that represents a specific slice of our community that has a vested interest in these things, it can be hard to make big complex decisions and we need a set of tools to be able to navigate those. The two models that I see on the landscape a lot are the tug of war and the weaving. And I think we all wanna be in the weaving space. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this. The tendency when we have the situation that you all have had over the last couple of weeks here, you have a ton of information, a big, complex, gnarly, politically scary decision thrown at you. Uh, you have information now that you've been waiting for for a long time and you have to figure out what to do with it. And the normal human tendency at this point is to start playing tug of war with either the product or the staff or the consulting team to say, I'm gonna try to pull it bigger, I'm gonna try to pull it smaller, I'm gonna try to pull it greener, I'm gonna try to pull it grayer. And the reality is that we all have to figure out how to implement this stuff together, right? That's the whole point of this board representing the interests that it represents is we have to somehow weave this thing that we can all work together to help implement. And I know you all already know this, but we don't talk about it overtly very often. And I think it's really important to do that because if we get in the tug of war approach, the staff is caught in the middle um, or the revenue model is caught in the middle. And so I'm gonna encourage folks as we move forward, you finally have the information and the context and the timeline and the deadlines that you need to be able to weave a cloth together that meets everybody's needs and sort of optimizes the balance of interests and values and priorities that are so skillfully represented by this board into a package that we can all actually work together to implement at the end of the day. Um, and I'm gonna move us along here. I was gonna talk about majority vote and consensus agreement. I guess I'll do a little bit. We do a lot in our culture in the majority vote realm. It's in our bylaws. We're gonna have a majority, we're gonna have a vote at some point. This is kind of how we do things in our system. It can get us much faster route to a decision, but I'm sure everybody has had this experience where you do a majority vote on a topic, it wins by a narrow margin. And then it turns out that some of the folks who voted against that actually have the ability to undermine implementation either by actively blocking it or um, by simply failing to act. And so I think it's really important to flag that and talk about it out loud um, as we move forward towards a vote that you may face in the spring or summer. Um, we want to start to build something that looks more like a consensus agreement. That's often in the world that I operate in and sort of conflict resolution facilitation. 
the consensus agreement is commonly seen as the ideal, the kind of secret story about that that I'm sure is not a secret from anybody is, well, that's a stronger path to implementation. It's also um, often mind-numbingly slow, slow, especially on this kind of complex issues. So if we sit here and work and tell everybody on this 17-person board is 100% happy with every single element of our revenue model, uh, to Jim's point, we're probably going to run out of money and probably a bunch of you will get tired of it and drop off the board before we actually get there. The other thing is that trying to come to a unanimous agreement, not just a consensus agreement, but a unanimous, fully unanimous, full hearted agreement on, on, uh, on complex issues. If you do it under time pressure, it often leads to false agreement or to watering down an agreement to an, do a level that you just can't afford in a revenue structure, right? Like you're gonna have to be frank and detailed about how this thing gets built and how this thing gets implemented. Um, one of my favorite international mediators, Jonathan Powell, if you have any favorite international mediators, maybe you know him, um, says only implementation builds trust. And we can do a lot in meetings to build trust, but at the point at which we start building this airplane together and starting to fly it, that's the point at which we build trust. And so the question that I have for you that I'm hoping you'll just kind of keep in your mind through the last couple of meetings is, or the next couple of meetings is, how can we make this majority vote feel to the people, you people who have to help us implement this thing, more like a consensus agreement? How can we make sure that we weave a cloth that has as much as possible of what everybody, every individual and every representative representative group and community needs here, um, but that doesn't slow us down or water us down um, and allows us to get to a meaningful decision as quickly as we can? I don't know how many folks are familiar with the National Policy Consensus Center at PSU. Probably a lot of you have worked with them at Oregon Solutions or one of one of that family. Steve Greenwood and Laurel Singer and their colleagues wrote a really cool book on collaborative governance where they discuss this very issue. So how do you have something that looks like a majority vote and is a majority vote for governance issues feel and act more like a consensus agreement in terms of implementability. And Steve Greenwood, I've been inviting Steve Greenwood out for coffee the last couple of months, and he's been very generously spending time talking with me about this topic. And I think their framework for this is really cool. So we can have something that comes down to a narrow majority vote, feel and implementability and trust a lot like a consensus agreement. If we think about these criteria, if every party feels like their opinion truly matters to the others, we're hearing each other, we're acknowledging, we're talking to each other, we're recognizing that we have diverse interests and priorities and values and preferences, but we're actually paying attention to each other's interests as well as to our own and the ones that we represent. Each party is given a genuine opportunity to weigh in. We all have some space and time to share those interests and make sure that we're feeling heard and, and acknowledged and that we really feel like the end product has done the best possible job to reflect them. And this is really my favorite is that conflict in those conversations is seen as a call for creative problem solving rather than something to be avoided. So we've been keeping you guys in a holding pattern for a long time. And now we have a, an opportunity with the proposal in front of us to start managing those conflicts of values and priorities and interests in a way that's much more direct and much more productive because we've got some meat to work on now. We've got an actual proposal on the table. So over the next couple of meetings, I'm going to be watching and I invite you all to watch as well because I'm trying to direct traffic as well and I don't always hold folks accountable for conflicts as they arise, but if we all do it together, we can. We have some tools that we can use um, where we can shift if you are our game and I'm going to encourage you to do this over the next couple of months from a uh, I need more of this, I need less of that, let's do this, let's do that to the staff, to the consulting team to where you're actually talking to each other, right? And uh, that's really hard to do on a 17 person Zoom call. So I'm gonna bring some tools to this conversation that I hope will be helpful. One is just calling in conflict. And so um, I'm gonna look for an opportunity and I'm bringing this up overtly in part because I don't want anybody to think I'm picking on them uh, for having conflict because conflict is good if you channel it into a productive dialogue, right? If it gets channeled into um, problem solving and decision making. And so I'm going to look for an opportunity, I encourage you to, too, to say, gosh, you know, Steve, you said this and Bob said this, and um, let's have you two talk about that. You can talk about it in the meeting, you can talk about it out of the meeting, but rather than just giving two different, you know, mutually uh, conflicting pieces of advice to the staff or to the consulting team, let's talk about it and work it out and figure out what to do with that. Uh, we could have a little caucus conversation on the side, and I put myself a nice big picture of the Quick Reference Guide to Oregon's Public Meetings Law here, one of my favorite documents. It sits on my desk. Uh, it's a fun read. 
uh, over a glass of wine some evening uh, to remind us that we might occasionally have to ask your council's advice on how we can implement these things within uh, Oregon's public meetings law. Uh, but there are usually ways to sit down and say, hey, there are three or four of you that have a shared interest in making a change to this model. Uh, if we can do it within public meetings law, how about if you go off and talk about that and bring out a proposal to the next meeting? And then we use that to really make a concrete proposal to the team instead of just a concern or a red flag or a frustration. Um, I like to do these little things called problem solving mixers where I just pick two or three people that are on different sides of the issue and say, why don't you guys go have a cup of coffee? Let me know if you want me to come and facilitate. There's not going to be a quorum. There's not going to be a decision deliberation. Come back and tell the team afterwards what you learned um, and whether there is a proposal actually that you can come up with that meets everybody's needs that we could hash over together in the full meeting as a strong group. So I may be giving Hong a heart attack right now or Jim or someone else. And I want to be clear that we have to put some parameters on this. And I don't want to dive into what those are today. But I want to prepare you for these conversations because it's a really cool ripe opportunity, you guys. People don't get to dig into this kind of challenge very often. Um, and there is a reason there's a diversity of interests on this board, and that's because that's what you need to solve the problem. So my last slide before I hang it over, hand it over to Sarah is I do have this other tool that you've probably seen in one, one form or another that I call stoplight polling. It's really similar to what uh, some folks call fist to five. Uh, I don't like to use hand gestures in meetings because it gets out of control too easily. So I use a little stoplight instead. Um, so before we get to a vote, we probably will have a number of issues come up where, you know, in order to move the conversation forward, we just need a quick room read on where are people at on this proposal. If Bob, Bob I'm going to pick on you, even though I can't see you on camera right now, just because I know you. And if Bob comes in and says, you know what, I'd like to expand the operating revenue budget by $30 million in order to um, plant poppies on the top of all of our levees or something something like that. Bob would never, of course, say that. Um, maybe I'm having trouble reading the room and I can call for a pseudo vote. I'm not going to ask you to vote on that. Um, but if we have a proposal on the table, I want to know not just are you a yes or are you a no. I want to know whether you actively support the proposal, whether you have concerns but wouldn't block it, or whether it's like, whoa, however this gets rolled into the final package, I can't support this and I can't support implementation. And then I'm going to say, you forgot the second part. The second part is here is what I would propose instead, right? Here is where I would like us to, to go instead. So I'm going to bring this back. I'm not probably going to use it today. I don't think we'll get that far along, but I'm going to bring this stoplight back in a future meeting and encourage us to be structuring our conversations in a way that we can, we can figure out what our negotiated solution is by using some of these tools, by using some breakouts, by using some polling, by using some human to human conversations, either in our large meetings or in smaller meetings um, to work through some of the complexity of this. And I think you'll end up with a package that is a much better solution for meeting your needs and that everybody can feel considerably better about at the end of the day than if we just sh sit here and share our feelings. And then at the end of the day, we have to vote on something that we have very mixed feelings about. So that is my proposal on process. I'm going to keep us moving along because I know that uh, probably nobody cares about process as much as I do. And I just wanted to float some concepts today. But I also want to make sure that we hand it over to Sarah here to really dig into the substance of what we heard from you last time um, and where we're headed next. What else you'd like to hear about? The discussion questions for today are the same as the ones from yesterday. So your questions, your concerns, your suggestions, we sent back around the slides from the previous conversations. Um, we really want to prioritize, I see your hand up, Mary Helen, just a sec. Uh, we really want to prioritize these legal and technical questions. We're happy to take the political ones. We really are taking these behind the scenes and sorting these into buckets and figuring out what to do with them next. And we'll talk about where they're headed next today. Um, but we have over the course of the next couple of months, we have a December 19th executive session where if we have legal questions in advance, it's possible that we could loop some operating revenue questions into that discussion. And while we've got Hong and Jeff Condit both there on the 19th, we want to make sure to flag any legal questions we can in advance. And we also want to flag any technical questions. Sometime in the first half of January, we'll have the te existing technical advisory group, the folks that we've talked about in the past that are kind of a standing committee, uh, not a committee, a uh, working group at our disposal of technical economics experts from a lot of the municipalities and other partners. We'll have them meeting in January, so we want to make sure to get them any technical questions we may need to be resolved that, that the ECHO team might want some help with. Mary Helen.
I've been talking for a, a long time. I just have a quick anecdote about Steve Greenwood and his book. It's excellent. <laughs> I've read it from front to back. And he was, I don't know how many people in this group were with the Levy Ready Columbia, but he facilitated that <laughs> for, I don't remember how many years. And um, he can't retire. Portland State won't let him just because of his value that he's given the community. So um, I saw somebody put in chat that they wanted the book information. So I would highly suggest that people read that because even if you don't participate in any board, you learn about it just in real life experience. I agree, Mary Helen. I have so much respect for Steve. I'm happy to share uh, even my copy of the book because I have three um, so that I can share them out, but I'll definitely share the book information. And I'm having drinks with Steve next week. So if there are process questions, feel free to toss those into the mix and I'll take them to Steve. He can be my little technical advisory group. Sarah. Thank you, I think Sarah. it's time for a change of Sarah's, don't you guys? Take you guys a rest. Are tired of listening <laughs> to me. Tell us about the stuff, Sarah. I'll keep running okay. the slides. Thank you. So let's go to the next one. <clears throat> okay, so I think Sarah's covered this. Uh, what we really want to do today is um, repeat back to you what we heard from you and the discussion that we had during our last meeting. Tell you how we're going to address it. Um, with the next steps, and you've you've seen a preview of of the procedural next steps, but getting into a little bit more about um, how we're thinking about this, and then really step back and and listen. You've had a chance for a few weeks now to um, sit with the information that that we went over and process it, and um, so we want to give you another opportunity to um, to bring forward any other thoughts that have surfaced over the last couple of weeks. Um, I don't plan to, to walk back through our slides and, and redo that presentation, um, but uh, I do have the slides at the ready here if we need to bring them up to, to discuss any, any key points. Um, but uh, yeah, so the, the balance of the discussion here will really be um, uh, us continuing to listen and making sure that we're getting the feedback from you to make the next steps that we have um, going into that second review really productive uh, and responsive to your concerns. So as we um, digested what we heard from all of you, uh, three categories really emerged that we were grouping the feedback into. and. Um, some of the feedback was related to the cost estimates that um, were served as the an input into the model, the forecast that Lori walked through. A lot of a lot of um, questions around how we characterize those costs, what they mean, and how they interact um, with the the revenue structure in the model. Uh, so that's the first category I'll talk through. The second um, set of feedback that we got really would translate into um, changes to the revenue structure and, and the way that we model that. And then finally, there were a number of really great questions and insights um, and, and, hard, uh, and, and feedback around um, how, you're digest how you're understanding the model results and how we can present the model results to make the discussion around them more productive um, and, and answer some key questions around that. So I'll get into to what that looks like. All right, Sarah, let's dive in. Um, so in that first category, um, that's the the forecast that we used. And remember, we used the, um, the medium scenario and um, and the number that went in there, which was the result of, of Lori's hard work and, and the work that you've done with her on that forecast, you know, there were some questions about that, that top dollar price tag. Um, that really broke into those several, uh, a, a couple of different ways to think about that. One is um, the actual programmatic, um, the costs that underlie um, that, that number. But that number is also the result of some, some assumptions that go into developing those costs. And one of those that we heard loud and clear was we're um, showing inflate, the inflated dollars um, and that you'd really like to see those in, in two, uh, 2022 dollars so that you can compare um, realistically. You don't have to think about, I think the example was uh, what is the cost of a gallon of milk in seven years and, and how does this compare to that? Um, we can adjust those numbers. So we're looking at them in, in 20, 2022 terms, um, and that changes the number that you see. It doesn't change what's going into the programmatic um, 
you know, to the programmatic side of it. Uh, there are a couple of other pieces of that that um, of the cost estimate that we can look at without actually tinkering with the programmatic side of things, which again, Laurie is going to do in her own process. Um, but when we think about the number that goes into the model, the um, the collection cost piece of that, which Sarah's already um, alluded to being a, a big topic of, of staff effort and continuing to refine that. Um, but when we think about the, the dollar amount that goes into the model, the collection costs and the way that we handle um, the uh, collection rate, uh, those are those are assumptions that would change that total amount and that we can we can tinker with um, to help you all understand what happens if you're able to get that collection cost number down <clears throat> and the, the collection rate up by using a different methods of collection. And then finally on the collection costs, and we you'll see this surface again under um, the presentation and communication of results, but a lot of questions about um, why we're looking at year five costs in the in the model estimate and in the the, the 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 budget that goes into the revenue um, structure that goes into the revenue model. And should we be looking at year one instead because that represents a, a lower total amount, dollar amount and the starting point for that. And um, there are a lot of questions embedded in that about why we might wanna go with year one versus year five and, and how you all want to, or a future board may wanna handle rate increases versus, um, you know, collecting collecting your five costs. Um, that's that is a, a cost estimate issue, and we can plug, but we can ultimately plug any number into the model. So it's a matter of communication and really trying to understand what question we're ultimately trying to ask with the revenue structure. Um, you know, do we want do we want to know what the revenue, what the rates are for year one costs and how those change over time versus what they would be at some stable point of operation. Um, Sarah, so, real quick before yeah. we move on, I just want to share, you know, I think we built, I want to be clear too, that this is mm -hmm. sort of a set of examples, not a, yep. not a not an comprehensive list. list of things we talked mm -hmm. about. And I also want to note too, in the, this was mostly focused on the last meeting, but that doesn't mean previous meetings, conversations were just, were, were, were forgotten about, right? And so sure. we had a lot of sticker shock in the last meeting. Um, but I want to reassure folks because we've also heard from a number of folks that uh, other elements of feedback <coughs> on that forecast that there are specific areas there that what have you been calling this, Jim, with staff like a, a push down pull up strategy there. There are areas of, of expenditure that there are a number of board members that really want to elevate and pull up at the same time. There's the sticker shock element of wanting to push down. So I just noted as we pulled together these examples that we leaned a little bit more heavily on the sticker shock side of that, but I, I don't want to give the impression to members who had concern, been had concerns about underspending in certain mission areas that we've missed that message yeah. somehow. And again, Absolutely. it's our intention to address some of those concerns at your next. Yeah. Uh, I don't no. remember which meeting it is. It's soon. It's another soon. week. Or within, within the month. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Sarah, for letting me interrupt there. No, sure. So yeah, that reflection that, that these are parallel processes at this point and they're interactive. Um, so what you work on with Lori and that conversation will ultimately feed back into the costs that go into the model. Um, and there are things that we can um, tweak um, as part of what goes into the model without actually touching the programmatic side of things. And just one more time, those were initial numbers and they're gonna change based on board yeah. direction. Exactly. Okay. Um, there were a lot of comments on what you saw in the revenue structure, and you only see three bullet points here. Um, there's a lot. There was a lot that we heard that um, are really embedded in these three very high overarching um, uh, kind of distillation of, of, of what we heard. And and so I don't want you to to see these three and say we only heard three things. There there were a bunch of things that we heard from you all, and this is kind of how we've aggregated. Um, we've aggregated it at this point, but we can unpack any one of these things um, in a lot of different ways. So when we think about revenue structure, there were a lot of, of comments um, about how, how we did the initial cost allocation to the geographies. If you recall that tiered graph that, or tier, tiered chart um, figure that we showed at the beginning, and the first step of that is looking at how we allocate the cost to geographies based on the benefits that they're enjoying. Um, and this gets to the 56 or 44 percent, or the 10 percent, and 90 percent. You know the different ways that we break that cost down. Um, 
<clears throat> so we, we heard a lot of questions about that and wanting some clarification um, on, on that. And then also um, ultimately uh, recognizing that that is one area, we're reflecting this back to you, that is one one of the major areas that has influence over how these costs are distributed across what which geographies. And it's a um, an area that we think would benefit from um, conversation with the TAG. And so that is one of the categories of conversations that we will have with the technical advisory group members, because a lot of it does um, depend on, on judgment calls underpinned by um, by technical assumptions, but you, reasonable people can make different technical assumptions. And so it's sorting through um, the pros and cons of those. And we think the, ta the tag is the be next best group to unpack some of that. Um, and then uh, uh, getting down into the sort of the, the, the next level of how we're defining the, the basis or the calculation that distributes those costs to the different customers, uh, we heard loud and clear that some um, one of those bases in particular that we had put in as a flat fee related to access within the managed floodplain, that that is regressive. And we agree. And we, we hear you loud and clear on that. And there are other ways that we can define that that really gets at um, the distribution of economic activity um, and the, the benefit associated with that. And um, there are some uh, some bases already embedded in the model that we can use instead of a flat tax to um, to uh, to replace that and and explore whether that provides a more appropriate um, method there. And and again, we heard uh, the question about whether we're using all of the data that we have available to us from the um, FCS studies and the Dogami studies. And again, we want to reiterate that we have reviewed all of that. Um, and it is useful to a point, but it is also insufficient at getting at the, the calculations that we need to make here. And so we intend to go back to the tag on this point as well um, for some technical uh, discussion around, um, given the data limitations, what is the best way to, um, to represent some of these calculations? And I saw a, a chat there in the comment come through. Do I need to be paying attention to what's in the chat? Oh, thank you, Eric. Great. Um, we definitely will look to your, your expertise as part of these ongoing conversations on that issue. Okay. Sarah, can you pop back real quick to the... Yeah, I just... Sorry, I, I don't know how to raise my hand anymore. Um, I just want to mention, Sarah Reich, you mm -hmm. just responded to Eric in the chat, but none of us can see the chat. So can you oh, repeat the question or the comment? My apologies. OK, that was yes. OK. Sorry, Sarah, I'm having a hard time getting used to our new, new things. <laughs> I um, am, too, and I've got one more window than screen going on here. So I think <laughs> Eric had shared some technical information with Sarah that I think Sarah was responding to. Sarah, I will keep an eye on the chat and okay. trans translate any actual questions. <laughs> no, thank you, Nancy. I, didn't, and Eric, uh, that was just I think I need one more screen. And I, think, that <laughs> I, th I think I need one more screen, and I think I need one more brain hemisphere to manage this productively. <laughs> so th thank you guys for being graceful about this. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Eric. Back to... Yeah, there's just one more thing here that I, um, that yeah. I wanted to, to flag under the revenue model and what we're thinking about. Um, we we talked about how we um, are distributing or we're we're looking at the economic benefit in terms of um, avoided disruption of economic activity. We have a calculation that we're using, a couple of different potential calculations we're using related to trip activity and jobs that work well for businesses. And we have a proxy variable we're using for residential customers. And that is something that we also can review to look at how those costs are distributed to residential customers um, with the tag whether we're using the right sort of um, stand-in variable there. So that was on the last, the last point under number two. And then finally, the last um, but really important um, set of feedback that we heard from you all is on how we uh, present the next round of results from the model and, and then um, think about how we communicate the results both internally and externally um, going forward. And 
So one of the, the key things that we heard here, all of the data that we've so far presented to you have been for customer type, different customer types that you all approved early on in the model development process, categories of customers. But um, within that, we are presenting sort of the average that spits out of the model related to those customer types. And that average may not actually be re uh, reflect the typical customer um, in the, uh, a typical customer that, that you can imagine um, on the ground. And you really are more interested in what that typical customer might look like. And we, we hear that it makes a lot of sense. Um, and um, rather than, uh, we think that that is another question that's appropriate for the, the technical advisory group to help us define what those typical customers would be. Um, of course, you all had some ideas as well that we've taken down on that. Um, and so um, we'll have a, a list of recommendations when we come to you next um, based on what we uh, hear from the tag on, on what the, those typical customers, um, what useful typical customers might be. Um, and we'll have a chance to revisit that with you. So then the next, the, the second round of, of model results would be presenting on those typical customers rather than the averages. Um, we also heard that you want for each of the typical customers, uh, the current rate comparisons um, for those who are paying, um, who, are, who are paying the charges, the assessments, current assessments. Um, and so we'll make sure that that is part of whatever we present here, you'll see a baseline um, number and then a new, a new rate so that you can really have a good sense of what that comparison is. Um, okay, and then we've talked about um, the third bullet there in terms of where we land on a cost estimate input, but really being able to describe this clearly, these are non-inflated costs or these are inflated costs, you know, wherever we land on what's most useful um, if they're 2022 values, recognize that inflation will affect them in the future, but right now we're just comparing apples to apples in 2022 dollars. And then um, again, whether we present year one costs versus year, co year five costs, you know, if we go with year one, it's important to communicate how that number might change over time um, and how that might translate into rate increases over the first few years to get to a, a you know, um, you know, level operating budget. Um, or whether we there is utility in going with that um, year five level operating budget and just saying that the cost would be cheaper in year one uh, or the rates would be less in year one um, because of the level of service there. And then there were some broader um, uh, comments and, and questions that you all had that we've translated here into um, a dis an important discussion and recognition of current service level um, and and what that looks like in the in the future and how that translates into the benefits that people receive for the um, the rates that they're paying and how those really will change in the future. Um, so a, a, a story around that um, that we all need to keep in mind as we're thinking about the costs and we need to think about how we communicate um, as the rate uh, the revenue structure comes um, uh, comes into into being, and then, um, yeah, I think that that's related to the to the next point there, uh, just about um, what level of service ultimately you'll be looking at needing to provide, and how you communicate about that. Sarah, we have a couple questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. One is not so much a question as that I spelled levy wrong in this uh, slide, and I take uh, full Whoops. responsibility for that. And I didn't um, catch it, so I'll take responsibility <laughs> for that. Well, when you have two kinds of yeah. levies going on in your life, yes. it's hard to keep them straight sometimes. We do have another question about the technical advisory group membership, and I remember that coming up in the last meeting. And I think, folks, we've committed to sending out the membership of that technical advisory group. We talked about it when it was established, but that was a while ago now. Um, and I think we just didn't get it done in between the meetings, which are now coming pretty fast and furious here. So, Jim, can we commit the the staff yeah, to sending well, around a membership list? And and if folks have recommendations of who to add, they haven't met in quite a while, right? And so this is they're kind of at the ready as our technical experts representing many of the folks here on the call. Yeah. So we have uh, the Metro Finance Lead and Economist. We have um, 
other finance directors from special districts. Um, we have some people who have been following the Levy Ready Columbia process for a long time, Andy Catugno, um, Phil Rolston, who was on the call, I believe has participated in that. So they are a, a handful of local government experts on rates and finance um, who have been tracking this project uh, since the early days really and helping us scope the work with ECHO and, um, and Seth, I don't think Seth's here today from Wood Village had suggested that we run the forecast by them and, and it's an excellent suggestion. And I think we might even have the meeting <coughs> scheduled, but I wanna rely on the experts for that. But we Maybe will send out the full real list. Real close to scheduling it successfully, but yeah, if we could send out a list and then Jim, I think you had had some questions from board members in the past, whether they could attend or either, or, or at least listen into those meetings. Um, do we know where think, we landed I think the on only that? thing would be if, if we have a majority of the board, we just need to notice the meeting, which is fine. We're again, we're happy or we could record it, but there's, we want people who would like to observe or hear it to be able to do it. it it's an important conversation. So we can, we can find ways to accommodate any level of interest in, uh, in following along. And we will report back clearly, Sarah, I know this is on your list and on a future slide, the results of the tag conversation will yeah. come in a synthesized version back to this board. So folks who do not want to listen to the whole conversation, but want to know the take homes can also have an opportunity to learn about that at a future board meeting. And one last emphasis point, if there is someone who you believe would be really helpful that would help you feel confident that we can get to attend, we'd be, we'd be happy to extend an invitation. Okay, folks, I recognize it's challenging to operate without chat here. I feel like somebody's taken away one of my hands. And so if you can please just, uh, I, I know some of the messages are getting through through Wendy, but even if you just have a quick question, please do just raise your hand and we'll open it up for discussion. It is it is challenging in the chat. I also wanna remind folks that we do actually record the chat. So if you're sending me your Wendy private messages, they're not private, they're part of the public record. Steve. Uh, just real quick on the tag, I think, you know, the tag has really good expertise on from the financial side, but some of these issues that I think you're proposing to kick over to the tag and they're, it's great to do that, but some of them, um, and particularly the one around the tiered rate structure around the watershed fee, you need the hydrology folks that can bring that expertise. And I think from Gresham, I need to be there. Um, I'm looking at Nancy. Nancy probably needs to be there from Portland. Um, it's it's a really important question. We we either need to have that discussed here at the board, um, or we need to have the right people to tag. So there's a distinction there, I think, Sarah, between technical, economic, technical issues and water technical issues, and stuff like your watershed allocate level yeah. geographic allocation you may only be able to make it so far with the economic technical advisory group. And so I'm hearing maybe our default is to bring that conversation back here. But if there's a need for a deeper dive on the sort of hydrological basis for that, then I see James, Nancy, and St Steve all sort of nodding that there's a need for, for the water people to have a technical opportunity for input there as well. And Mr. Yeah, Chair, and Perhaps it's appropriate to just remind the economics folks that the hydrology is really complicated. And so they should keep that in mind as they're discussing their impressions of our approach. And, and Steve, I think, I don't mean to speak for you or anyone else on the call here, but um, to the degree that we can simplify the basis and the geographies, I think we may end up with an easier process to get implemented. So with that sort of direction, I recognize that depending on where we go with these geographies, we may need to dive in deeper on the, the hydrograph of the district, but um, maybe we can avoid some of that technical conversation based on where the financial conversation goes. But duly noted. Yeah, and yeah. Hung, has a, Hung has a hand up here to respond as well. Yeah, I just want to add that uh, whether the technical, the hydrological technical discussion needs to be had, this board will have to approve a an ordinance definition of that, and so we'll need to have that conversation and some sort of aspects of that definition that this board is comfortable with. So the er, the, the the stronger the desire for that technical discussion, the earlier we should have that. It's coming. And as I recall. So. Yeah, thanks, Hong. And as I recall, and Nick, maybe you can um, correct me if my memory doesn't serve here, but when the, we met with the TAG earlier um, in earlier this year, 
about defining the different levels of geography in the watershed. And there was some uh, uh, about using the, the um, the data, appropriate data sources for defining the level of geography. Um, and I know that uh, we did get some input from um, City of Portland folks on, on that data set, you know, um, and then related to that, um, we're using staff technical um, support as well to help us define that. So the hydrologic questions weren't ignored um, in the process. We may not have had all of the right voices around the table. And so I really appreciate um your your point there uh but there i think there's been a recognition um throughout the process and and with the tag the last time around that hydrology is absolutely critical and there's a tension between the correct hydrology and the data used to represent that that um, we'll probably want to verify great thanks nancy yeah, I just like to concur. I think that it is iterative, like the more you know, mm -hmm. the more you're like, wait, we have to revisit that thing. And I think mm -hmm. the um, the hydrology piece would be a really interesting one to revisit, a, a necessary one, critical, that's mm -hmm. the word I'm looking for. And then yes, bring it back to the board and explain and um, vote on mm -hmm. it and stuff like that. Great. Yeah. Sarah, we can, I think, flag that for the tag conversation to sort of revisit at the end and say, is our hydrology question here going back to the board? Is our hydrology question needing some offline discussion on that technical aspect? Um, kind of depending mm -hmm. on where where our discussion and basis leads us in that. Thanks mm -hmm. for flagging that, Steve. That seems really important. Um, I think Sarah just has another slide or two here. Let's let's keep yeah. it going, and then we'll have uh, quite a bit of time still to to flag or discuss new issues. Yeah, and I think I actually, um, I think I hit on most of this as um, as we were going through, but just to emphasize the points with the cost estimates, um, Lori is is working on, you all will work with Lori in the next meeting or in uh, upcoming meetings on the forecast itself. Um, and uh, I think there'll be an opportunity for tag input on that piece of it. Um, there's not a lot of active work that we, the ECHO team, will have on this piece. Uh, we'll be you know, waiting to, to hear what clarifications come from Lori, apart from um, you know, whether we uh, want to independently adjust some of the cost, um, the cost of collection data, which the model can, um, we can tinker with those assumptions independent of the cost of forecast. Um, on the revenue structure side, we've talked about the um, the next step for us there is to to meet with the tag, and then we will come back to you before we make the changes out of that with a summary of how we intend to direct, to address um, each of the issues, and you'll have another chance to weigh in at that point um, before you see model results. And then um, same thing for um, presenting and communicating the results going forward. There's a, another point here that that I wanted I didn't want to get to lose. Um, and it's uh, it's independent of the revenue structure, the revenue modeling exercise itself, but it is an important piece here. Um, when we look at the next round of revenue um, model results, uh, we'll be um, really focusing on the equity implications of them and having some discussion around what the tools are that we have to, um, to mitigate some of those impacts um, outside of the revenue model. So we don't wanna lose sight of that. And I know the that we had several um, questions and points of conversation around um, a, a fee waiver and, and other tools that other jurisdictions use and what's available for this jurisdiction or for this board, board to think about. Um, so that's a, a piece of the conversation that is um, forthcoming. And we'll really be able to dig into on the next round. Sarah, I put this mess together. Do you want me to just highlight anything <laughs> that you haven't already talked about? <laughs> or sure, I, I, and, and I wanna make sure we have mess time for I don't remember yeah there we go Just, I think you've um, actually hit on the key process points I'll come back to that next yeah. meeting slide at the very end and maybe folks can help me remember to do that but I I want to put back up the buckets here Sarah I think you know for me that was a really helpful review of our last conversation what we didn't want to do is come ask you the same questions as last time mm -hmm. and have you be like I told you last time why are you asking me the same question again but we ran out of time last time and so I know folks will have taken a look at the slides uh, since then and had a little bit more time to contemplate. And so I, I think we do want to open the floor for the remainder of the time here um, for additional questions, concerns, suggestions. Again, being mindful that we want to prioritize technical or legal questions that we may want folks to be working on over the next few weeks. 
Um, and again, with that commitment to come back with a proposed set of changes at one of our January meetings, kind of depending on the timeline of these of these other conversations, um, before we ask the ECHO team to to bring us a new um, a new straw man to work with. I'm going to pull down the slide here and just open the floor. Do folks have ideas, questions, concerns that you want to flag for the group? Um, Anything we missed from last time or that's come to your attention since we last talked? I see Shirley and then I saw Nancy. Go ahead, Shirley. Uh, well, uh, my timing might be wrong here, uh, so I'm um, glad to be told to wait. I, I, I will attend one more meeting before I leave office. Um, but I wanna make sure, I, I just wanna ask, I, I, I'm concerned about the the challenge that this group will have in getting the bond measure passed, and this group is the is responsible for that. It's not the staff, and I I, I might suggest is that staff might I know Jim, of course, is very experienced uh, with uh, measures with his work at Metro. But uh, maybe there, this group might want, need um, to have a review of how you pass a bond measure and the steps you go through and the timelines in, um, that are part of it. Uh, you know, I, since I've been on the Metro Council, there, we've passed three levies, two bond measures, and a business income tax, so, or a business tax, not an income tax. And um, so, but those, they're not easy and they take a lot of time. And I, I feel like if I'm looking back at my 12 years on the council, I spent a lot of time raising money and it takes, it's going to take this group to have to raise money for that campaign. And, uh, and then there's a, a big lead up time and preparing the district for this measure. Then there's the campaign there's, and then you have to fund the, you have to hire a campaign manager and the group is going to help you raise the money. And then you got to do raise the money. So I don't know, I just got to throw out there is uh, Jim and staff, maybe one of the presentations at a future meeting is what it takes to get a, to pass a successful measure. Because I sure would hate to have you do it, have to do it more than once. It's miserable enough for one time, but you sure don't want to do it again. Shirley, you got a big thumbs up from Eric Molander there. And Jim, I think that's I think that's a perfect segue to the next meeting, right? And really glad yeah. to hear that Shirley's gonna be here for one more meeting. Yeah, so Councilor Craddock, I just really appreciate you continuing to raise that critical path item. And um, we spent this morning as your staff talking about the next meeting where we are going to roll out our proposed beginnings of the outreach process to frame out the, board, the board's uh, thinking and information that you'll have to make decisions around what kind of a bond you want to refer and what rate is acceptable to you. And we've done some analysis of key stakeholders. And as you know, we did a first round of polling and we've completed a second round of focus groups. But I really like your suggestion of maybe bringing somebody in who can sort of walk through the, the public sector transition to a private organization's efforts and just how people typically manage that. I think that's a very useful suggestion. But what I want all of you to hear is that your staff's thinking hard about these things. And it's one of the reasons I'm trying to keep a little bit of pressure on you to go quickly without hurrying, because we do need that time to build awareness and support in the community to get the capital dollars we need to really achieve our objective here, um, which is to keep us uh, from having to buy flood insurance and to, to keep us dry in high water events. So well, we are thinking hard about it. And just throw out there, a campaign could cost as much as two hundred thousand dollars. I mean, you got to think about what that what the campaign budget will be, let alone what here the budget for the the bond measure will be and the operating levy will be. So, um, there that's on the board. You're, it's your job will be to raise that money so the campaign will be successful. Jim, my impression is you've got uh, Kearns and West really actively sort of engaged in helping you think through a timeline and process here. And I believe that Jamie Damon from Kearns and West is joining us for the next meeting, right? So I think that that may be a really helpful next step. Um, and, and just just another, you know, we have FM3 as our pollster and we have Praxis Political who's helping with some of the stakeholder outreach. And Councillor Craddock, you're familiar with Noah Siegel who helped successfully manage some of the bonds for Metro and, and he's on our consultant team as well. So all that work is happening. 
we need to engage you guys a little bit more to make sure we're within the boundaries of your policy guidance on what kind of a bond and how much we're asking for. So um, we're, we have a, we're, we're working on the plan to follow through once we get a little bit more direction and ensure we're in the boundaries of where this board wants us to be. Okay, so very next meeting. Nancy, same topic or different topic? I saw you nodding a little bit there, a little different. Go for I it. Was I was nodding. I'm thinking, oh, I hope that 200K is in our our uh, operations thing here, but I'm sure it is because you guys have things it, it, like that. It can't of. be because it can't be public money. So again, there will oh. have to be a private committee that's going to do work oh, oh, on okay. the political side of things because it's illegal for public employees to do that. And so again, oh, we're, thinking of, we're thinking about all those things. And there is some legal things that we can do with public money. And we're working carefully with Hong and our consultants to ensure that we stay well on the right side of the bright line of public use of funds. Um, but it's one of the reasons in your proposed budget last spring, we included funding for government funded mailings to describe the facts about what we're doing here. Um, so right. we have a little bit there, but again, there will need to be a private effort. What this board's role in that remains to be defined, but we will need to raise some money in a private effort um, to help with the information to get this thing passed for sure. Well, I'm glad we're focusing on that because there are things that, like that's kind of a basic one that I just forgot about. So thank you for that. That would be good. So here's the reason I really raised my hand. Um, uh, in terms of covering like, you know, looking at like the high uh, level things, when I looked, take a, when I took a look at the materials after they were explained, it was really helpful. And I looked at a couple of slides that really stood out to me, which, and one of them is uh, slide 26 or something. It says the share by jurisdictions, depending on which of the four ways we go as, or, or yeah, detailed, managed floodplain only, blah, blah, blah. So manage, and what stuck out to me was this, manage floodplain only, that's basically what we have now, right? Might be a different revenue structure, but basically manage floodplain only, and that's 84% is in Portland. And so I'm thinking, okay, you divvy up the land and about 84% of it is in Portland right now. And then um, if we look at the other three, the only the last one that has the whole district keeps it at around 84%. The rest of them shift the money out of Portland, the collection out of Portland, which I thought unusual because if I'm putting my equity hat on and I don't know a whole lot about all the demogra demographics, but I'm thinking generally more affluent people live in Portland. like. Maybe Lake Oswego is an outlier. Like, I don't really know, and I hope nobody gets mad at me. But what I'm thinking is, why would we shift the burden of payment out of Portland and onto Gresham, Troutdale, Fairview, Wood Village, Lake Oswego, Maywood Park, and the other places? So that was, I was a little concerned about that percentage. Just with an equity hat on, I don't know, as a Portland representative, if I'm supposed to say, hey, let's keep us paying all the money. But, um, I'll, I'll just say that that was one of my big takeaways and my other big takeaway that, and I'm putting this out there because I think it will be a context for our discussions. My other big takeaway is when I look at um, the one that has managed floodplain only because again I'm thinking this is basically what we have now and it says well I lost a slide but it was something like for single family residential if you're looking at managed floodplain only they pay like 1440 annually right and this is an average it's not an example and then if i you know take the inflation out of it assuming that the inflation was five percent per year because i don't know it's like in today's dollars 1200 uh dollars annually so that means that if we don't spread this out over a bigger district and we get all the federal money and we get all the money that we expect People in single family residential, I heard last time it was like 100 to 400 and now they'll be paying 1200 a year. So that's a huge difference. So I think that is our baseline. Like that's the baseline. If we don't get this working properly, 
managed floodplain, single family, and everybody else at their higher levels is going to be paying a lot more. And that is the reason we are trying to get this urban flood safety district funding structure together. So I thought those two things were very uh, strong points to go, oh, if I'm looking at this overall, we're coming down from 14, uh, 1200, 1220, we're coming down from that. And we need to look at what it looks like regionally who pays. So thank you for listening to that. But I, I hope that anyone, everyone else finds, or anyone else finds this. Nancy, useful. you've been you've been getting a lot of nods, especially from our East County municipalities, and now a thumbs up and a heart, which I don't think I very often see a heart emoji in a public board meeting. So I'm an engineer I think your message is <laughs> I think your message is well received here, Sarah. Any any uh, feedback or or clarification? I tried to pull up the slides and I couldn't quite get there in time, but I think I, you got you got Nancy's message here. Okay, looks think, like everybody's yeah, gone. The one other you, piece Nancy. that we're working on, and I, I've been talking about this in so many different groups. I apologize if we're repeating this information, but we were are working with um, some insurance brokers to try and determine what flood insurance costs would be should this enterprise fail, right? So when mm. you're comparing an existing assessment in the floodplain, you really need to not compare it with what we're proposing for the urban district. You need to propose it to the actual alternative that's available, which is in fact, changing the zoning, getting the maps changed and having to go on the market to buy flood insurance. And so again, we're, we're trying to get some archetypical examples of what flood insurance costs might be. So that should be also informative to the board um, as you're thinking about your decision making. Mary Helen, yeah. you, oh, sorry, go ahead, Nancy, but Mary Helen's had her hand up for a little while. So go, yeah. let's go ahead and close this right. topic. I just, I, I agree with all that Nancy said, and it's, I'm, I'm glad that you're looking at insurance brokers because that's been an issue in speaking to people. Well, why don't I just buy my own flood insurance and it will cost me less because of, those projected costs. And I don't have a dispute to that, but I also want to just and um, hit me in the head and, you know, um, laugh Hard to do on answer. this one, but have we really landed on the, if we don't get a geo bond and it costs $200,000 and what we've heard from research or whoever we're using for research is there wouldn't be any problem or it looks optimistic that it would pass, but I've had feedback that it might not. So if we allocate $200,000, the geo bond doesn't pass. We, I'm going to say lost $200,000. And do we have a backup plan for that? Jim, or, I think only there, you can answer that question. There, there, Mary Helen, there really is no other source of capital dollars available to us from my perspective. It's possible we could get the state of Oregon to let us use their borrowing authority, but we've run those trap lines a little bit and it's just not optimistic. So I think what we would end up doing would be needing to go back to pollsters and community conversations and ref refining or changing that bond ask of voters and going out for another election to see if we could uh, win support from a majority a second try. You guys have looked, if I can synthesize a little bit, Jim, you guys have looked pretty darn hard for a plan B, C, D, and E here. And it's, this is the plan. Yeah, the legacy <laughs> districts do not have authority to issue a bond to call for a, a geo bond. So the new district has to do it. And they're, they really don't have the capacity financially within the existing managed flood plan to float that kind of debt without it being you know, really oppressive for the landowners in the, in the flood plain. Okay, so what I was, um, I guess what you're saying, there's no plan B, C, D, or E, but, uh, in my mind, if a geo bond fails for the $31 million that the staff recommends that you need, I would think that a plan B was to reduce the need for a budget at $31 million. Okay, but the, okay. Uh, sorry, Mary Hunt, those are very separate topics, right? So the voters okay. don't need to approve the 31 million, the board needs to do that, and that's operating dollars. The bond is for capital dollars, they're very okay. separate. So plan okay. B on the operating revenue is a, a lower number that the board would approve and be willing to put out there. It's possible our, our operating revenue could get referred to voters, but we're working hard with Hong and our outside council 
to do everything we can to ensure that that is either difficult or that if it is referred, we'll be successful, or if it's challenged in court, that we'll win. Okay. And that's why that's why we're constrained in terms of how we develop this methodology for who pays what and how they benefit and what costs they create. It's why we're constrained in how we shift those costs so that we don't need a plan B. And so again, please separate the operating 31 okay. million, which again was an initial number with the 150 million in capital that would be put on property taxpayers with a successful election. They're, they're different pots of money. Okay. I, um, sorry, Jim, if I can just add, for those of you who remember the Levy Ready Columbia days, I think it's really important to, to, to recall back that when we looked at all the options, some of the options that were on the table were determined to be um, not, uh, you know, less ideal than a new district that continues on its own. But there were options such as, you know, other entities, other jurisdictions absorbing this work. At the end of the day, and I don't want to say that, like, I'm sorry, Metro, I'm sorry, the city of Portland, I'm sorry, people, to, to bring this back up. But at the end of the day, <laughs> the fail-safe measure here is somebody absorbs this work. Nobody wanted to do that. And so that's why we're here where we are today. And we've worked really hard over 10 years to get to this point, narrow the options, narrow the options. But I just don't want anyone to walk away thinking, like, there's absolutely nothing. It would be really difficult and we would be going through we would be going back 10 years to sort of rework all that stuff but it's not I don't want residents in the managed floodplain to hear the message that if we don't if something bad happens we're just ultimately you know completely on our own there there will be something figured out but this is the best option we've got based on years of stakeholders and municipal governments you know working through this and deciding to get us to this point. Okay. I think you. my Mary Helen, I think Mike Jordan used to call that plan Z. It's not yeah. plan B. Well, <laughs> you're starting over a 10 year process or you're handing it over to the city of Portland and Port of Portland, which probably a lot of you don't want to do. It was a little scary to hear 10 years because I've been saying seven years. So those three years got lost to my memory somewhere. <laughs> well, I am not but, a numbers person. I may have rounded incorrectly so there. The, the capital oh. cost is, um, because now I'm a little bit confused because there's administrative costs to administer the capital costs. Am I saying that correctly? Yeah, I think we may that, need some, yeah, I'm I, gonna let you go, Jim. I think we may need some offline clarification, Mary yeah, Helen, because okay, I got, a, I got mean, a, line, a line of hands up. Is that okay? No, but I'm I think sorry. No, it's clarify this in some talking points. Because I was comparing capital costs to operating costs, but if there's operating costs involved in capital, then um, Jim can explain that to me some other day. We're, we're able to cap capture those from the bond. If there, if there are administrative costs for implementing the capital program, then we can legally charge those to the bond. We can sum reason. this up to Mary Helen, to your first point earlier. We can sum this up in a way that makes it easier to communicate externally, and, and we will. And, and Mary Helen, I suspect you're not the only one with these questions, so I appreciate absolutely. you Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Mary Helen, I'm going to put your hand down for you and call on Eric if that's okay. I did it. I did it to you. You can put it back up if you need to. No, I just said I've used up all my time. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Helen. Um, so a couple of three points on revenue principles. The first one is that I want to get back um, in our proposal to some sort of proportionality of the uh, cost of the fees of the levy to the benefits and uh, to make certain that that sense of fairness that we had in the LRC document uh, comes through in the proposal that we're doing here. The second element uh, that we need to incorporate into this revenue proposal has got to be some element around a progressive tax and here there will be groups of people that um, benefit from the work that we're doing on the levy, but don't have the capability to pay. And I'm okay with that. Uh, this is one of the principles around a progressive tax. The third element is that we have not included any of the direct billings, and those need to be put back into our revenue estimates so that we have uh, that two and a half, three million million 
that we currently receive largely from the city of Portland uh, for stormwater that that be put back into our revenue. And then finally, Jim, uh, I like the idea of going out to insurance companies and we need to do that in a couple of senses. First, um, we need to ask FEMA once we make it so that we're at the 0.2% probability, uh, what will that do? And will you redraw the maps uh, so that the FEMA provided insurance uh, reflects those lower probability of risk. And I think that that's a fair question to FEMA and sort of puts them on notice that if um, the citizens of Portland are going to invest heavily in reducing flood risk, that the benefit should accrue to them as well in reduced FEMA insurance costs. Uh, in that same vein, one of the core economic principles that we need to address is the benefit to our commercial, industrial, and logistics industries that comes from mitigating business interruption losses. And again, what I think that you'll find, uh, I'm not certain of this because it's been a long time since I've shopped around for it, but that business interruption loss insurance is very expensive uh, and probably is more expensive than even flood damage. So, uh, and that's largely because it's a function of the value added at the location. And if you shut down a, um, a semiconductor plant in Gresham uh, for three days, that costs order of magnitude, $21, billion, $21 million a day for it being shut down. Um, and that's, that's probably more than the actual flood damage to it. So those are the four points that I wanted to make. Uh, bring back in some sort of proportionality, fairness to it, address it in terms of, of a progressive tax structure, include the direct billings, and then finally, uh, to use that insurance estimate as a mechanism to uh, identify uh, who really benefits from, from the work that we're doing. Yeah, really similar to Nancy's point. So the first two, Sarah, thanks, Eric. That was really helpful. I saw Sarah nodding and taking notes. I think the first two, Sarah, at the beginning of the, or the proportionality, yeah, the first two, the beginning of the last conversation, we put up those decision criteria and then didn't really come back to them. So it might be interesting if we mm. have a chance in January to sort of connect the dots between, yep. hey, we said fairness, proportionality, uh, equity, yep. how does that actually get reflected in, you know, a proposed revised model here? And then we had at the end of that book and Eric, your your point about sort of insurance comparables and pricing, which I saw Colin nodding and I think we got that. Mm -hmm. Sarah, I wanna make sure, because I think I saw a little brow furrow, the question about the direct payment on stormwater fees from Portland. If you if you got Eric's point there and are able to, to work that into the next conversation or if you need any clarification there. Okay. I guess I, yeah. I feel compelled to, and maybe I'm mistaken and you know what they say about assuming, but I've assumed that our new rate structure would eliminate those direct yes. bill arrangements. And would, I think would that's... replace, not would replace. But you're Thank letting yes. the cause. Okay, yeah. see, this is, and Eric, I, I think we need some clarification. Yeah, and I think here. that's at least yeah. the city of Portland's perception. That may not be where we land, but I think that's the operating principle that at least I've assumed. And you know what they say about assuming? I want to be clear about that. The board can decide, but we've been operating under assumption that the revenue model would um, eliminate the need for those direct Billings. Eric, can you clarify your concern there? I think we probably will need to come back to it given time, but like just to make sure that we, you know, have a, a nice pin in that for next time. Can you clarify the, um, the concern around the stormwater billing? Um, it's really um, no representation without taxation. I know it's a change from what we did in New England, um, but what we have here is the the homeowners and industries within Pen2 get billed for stormwater fees from the Water Bureau. Uh, but those fees really are a function of the services that Pen2 and MCDD and Pen1 provide. And so it is fair game for, for uh, the city of Portland 
to compensate us for the use of the slough and our piping uh, for uh, water runoff. Thanks for the clarification, Eric. Nancy, I know this isn't why you put your hand up, so I'm not going to make this the, your turn, but I do of... want to give Nancy a chance to respond. But well, okay, Jim, the, clarification the, from you. The costs are going to be attributed to City of Portland residents, but they will be collected in a different fashion rather than through the IGA that we currently have that's separate. So those costs that are created by Portland residents would be borne by Portland residents in the future. It would come through a different agreement. Mm -hmm. Eric, so I, see a flash, bill, right, I see so, a flash so this, of skepticism I, behind I wanna, your eyes. You want to make sure that we're not creating a, fair, a free ride here. Is that right. correct? Correct. Correct. And, and okay. Portland's in the same boat. They don't want us to charge for services they feel like they're providing. So you're on to a legitimate issue here that we need to parse, right? What that the services that, that the district residents pay for are separate and apart from anything they're paying from somebody else. And if there's overlap, you can't charge twice for that. You're absolutely right. And you can't charge zero times for it either, but what is the mechanism to collect that money for those services? And it yeah. may be different, but Nancy, I want to give you a chance to respond and also to return to your original <laughs> issue if you wish. Well, it gets to Steve's original point about the complex hydrology, right? So that at a certain mm -hmm. point, there's going to need to be some conversations about that to ensure that we're tracking. Who's paying for what water to go where? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we've got it though, Eric. I think we've got it now and we'll we'll work on it and bring it back. Okay. Nancy? Yeah. And it would be good to have this really clear because there is, you know, in the same way that, so addressing your question, Eric, the amount that of stormwater fees that people in Pen 1, Pen 2, and part of MCDD pay to the city of Portland has to do with being able to access streets citywide exactly the same thing you guys don't pay mm -hmm. what's called on-site fees which mm -hmm. has to do with your system that's internal to your district okay so that's that's with pen 2 and pen 1 specifically and so yes we so it's very actually uh analogous to what we're trying to do here with the urban flood safety water quality district by having people pay fees to have um who don't live in the district in order for those benefits that they get and absolutely these igas are very likely to go away so there will be no direct billings because it will all be figured into the rate structure um and so absolutely i think we need to be really clear on how that works out because everyone in pen 2 and pen 1 and mcdd who are also in the city of portland will be asking that question so good point. okay so we we need to clarify that there's not a we need to show our show our work there i see sure. Yeah, and, and but, just, but that's why the direct billings are included, right? Because they probably won't be there. And Nancy, just related to that, we're, um, when we talked about presenting baseline costs um, to compare to new rates, that's for the people who are paying the assessment in the managed flood plain, but there's also recognition that there's that cost that is currently being paid through the direct um, bill arrangement right. that we want to represent in those baseline costs. So those people in the watershed who would be paying the new fee, they actually have been paying all along at some level, and we want to make sure that that's um, reflected in the information. Right. Okay. So here's what I was going to bring up. Um, mm -hmm. That was a good one. Um, let's see. Uh, another thing for you, Eric, regarding FEMA and remapping, there's been a whole bunch of proactive work the city of Portland and other jurisdictions have done in the Johnson Creek watershed, and the city of Portland has been... Uh, champion at the bit to remap to help those people out in the Johnson Creek floodplain. But when you remap, you have to remap a whole community, which means the whole city of Portland. And if we remap the districts right now, they'll get mapped out of the floodplain. So we have been holding off until this work can be um, uh, can be resolved and moving forward so that pen, the pen, the districts all of the districts in the city of Portland don't get de-accredited. So, so the reason I'm saying that is because absolutely there is a lot of push to remap and it costs something. And I'm sure the city of Portland and the new district and everyone will help pay for that. Um, and yes, yeah, so those people can get those benefits. Right now we're holding off. I can just add that I um, meet with Region 10 FEMA staff at least once a year, usually twice a year, and they um, are they solicit what 
activities um, we have accomplished and where we're moving as far as those recertification projects. So there are eyes on us from Region 10, um, in addition to uh, Nancy's point around remapping uh, for the city of Portland and Johnson Creek watershed. So as soon as those projects are accomplished, uh, there will be a remapping. Uh, but right now, FEMA knows that we're making good uh, progress on them, and especially because we have the other federal involvement with the Army Corps of Engineers, um, they are going to hold on the remapping until we accomplish those uh, projects so we remain accredited. Right, and so I'm going to cede the floor in just a minute, but while, I still, while I'm still, i getting those hearts and nods from East County, I also want to emphasize that I know we have a a money structure to work with, but we also have to uh, accomplish those other mandates we have, and um, that's going to be uh, more going forward. But, but to my mind, even in the high option, it's not nearly close enough. So we have to work out the how you spend the money that you end up allocating later. We're going to come back to it next time. You guys are talking to each other. I'm so proud of you. This is great. This is working very well. I've got Corky and Tanny's hands up. I've got eight minutes. If you want to make sure you get a word in before three o'clock, please do put your hand up so your colleagues can make sure to leave time for you. Um, otherwise, we, we have a lot to chew on and a lot to work on here and a bunch of other places to send the information and analysis to bring back to you. Corky. Oh, I can't hear you, Corky. Are you using the right mic? Okay, uh, let's go to Tani and Corky. I'll come back to you. Just make sure you're using your laptop mic or see if you have to shift it around there. Go ahead, Tani. Hey, good afternoon. Hey, couple of things. Um, have we thought about uh, like businesses that don't contribute any water to the system? They have their own injection systems. Are their charges gonna be different? Colin, I feel like I've heard you guys talk about that, but that's way beyond my depth. Yeah, so what a great question, Tanny. So currently, um, and an updated version of this has just been worked out between um, Bill and his engineering staff at MCDD and uh, Bureau of Environmental Services for at least uh, the city of Portland portion of this watershed. But we do have um, a 2019 uh, map that has basically where all those injection, those UIC injection dry wells uh, are located. And so that is the watershed extent that we're currently using. Um, and I think we'll be working with the other jurisdictions. Bill has had some conversations with the city of Troutdale um, that aren't formalized yet, but about updating those things. But it's a long way of answering, yes, we are uh, taking those more um, advanced uh, watershed extents into this consideration. And I think that's really what uh, Nancy and Steve were, were mm -hmm. advocating for as well, that there needs to be that sort of technical and hydrological uh, analysis on this too. Okay, thanks. So Great. I represent the east end of the earth um, way out there. And, you know, looking for is something that is property specific. I got an airport, I got Amazon, I got FedEx, I got fast food, I got storage, and I can't really tie this back. The only thing I'm really seeing is it looks like to me about 75, 77% of the revenue is going to be coming from commercial and industrial customers. Is that probably pretty close to correct? Sarah, can you help us with that? Uh, I think both in terms of the revenue proportion and maybe any any glimpse you guys can give us into how you're starting to talk about sample customers, because um, you, you kind of flag that for next time, but it sounds like mm -hmm. a little more detail would be helpful. That's, and I could just take this later. Let me just fire out a couple more because I know we're tight on time. Okay. If that's okay. Um, and looking at this, you know, we're looking at talking about somebody's inventory, the number of jobs, their sales and putting a premium on that that's i'm just telling you that's going to be really hard to do from a revenue standpoint because these businesses like amazon their inventory is changing continually number of jobs are changing continually and we're going to charge them for that but then on the other side if you're out in the district you're paying right for the economic benefit so these people are having to pay more because they're creating it an economic benefit for the rest of the system. 
Am I looking at that right? There's a lot embedded in that, <laughs> um, and and the data sources that 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 we had. You know, we're limited ultimately in the um, and measuring those things by the the data that we have available. And there are a couple of different ways to think about it. You have, um, you know, ultimately what we're trying to measure is the the econo a, a proxy variable for the economic activity um, and the the way that a business engages in in the overall economy. Um, as a as a way of describing their reliance on the economic activity in the in the floodplain, and so you know we're we're having to step back a few a few um, uh, layers from from having data that describes exactly that relationship, and um, and we are limited for a couple of different reasons. Part of it is data resolution, and then part of it is also. Um, data uh, confidentiality constraints and 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 the fact that if we're using a specific variable that um, we may run into some um, some legal questions that we will talk about in a different forum. So there's a lot embedded in here. you're you're getting at the the core of the question and what we're trying to measure here um, and doing the best that we can from a technical perspective. and that's why we're going to continue to talk with the technical advisory group on um, whether, the the way that we've proposed to define that calculation um, is is appropriate for the 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 purpose that we're using it here for, and so just kind of broad context um, so that you understand what we'd ultimately like to do and what we ultimately can do, um, and those two things we want them to be as close as possible, but they're not going to be identical. Yeah. So. Um, Tanny, if I can sum up real quick, I think I hear two concerns there about your East County, mostly businesses, commercial industrial folks. One is what's what does what does the rate impact look like for customers of that yep. type? And we have kind of some sample customer conversations where we might want to make sure that we're using sample customers that address East County specific issues in that. And the other is the validity of the proxy for a really unique set of customer types that maybe we mm -hmm. can, as Sarah says, take that to the tag and then bring the conversation back to the board and kind of test the reality of, of a revised proposed example, yeah. which I know goes back to some of Eric M's previous questions as well. Yeah. What we are not proposing to do, just to be really clear, is to actually um, build into the, the calculation the you know, specific data points, say, of inventories or of specific numbers of jobs at a particular business, um, we're using proxy variables to represent the general magnitude across the region relative, you know, in a relative way. For, for just the um, reason Tanya described, right? It's just too, it's exactly. too variable, it's yeah. too complex, it's too, exactly. it doesn't work. And so that'd yes. be helpful. And just, to, yes. you know, I just look at this and I just think we need to be careful because if we're gonna triple mm -hmm. what we're charging today and we don't have the right message going out there, I don't think there's any way a bond passes. <coughs> you hit people with a with a big charge and then you come back and, and say, go hey, around the other door and ask for money. Too. I think we're gonna pin ourselves mm -hmm. in a bad place. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's see if we can get some more clarity and some more specificity on our sample customers <coughs> and our customer impacts as we head into these January conversations, right? And I think to Jim's point, you're gonna see the total number change, you're gonna see the customer impact changed, and we're gonna yeah. make some changes or Echo Northwest will come back to you with some proposed models. But Tani, I think you're you're doing exactly what we asked here, which is to kind of think about the communities you represent and how this broad brush approach might unexpectedly play out in different ways in different types of communities. So this is really helpful feedback. And you might be shocked when you see how much they're some of those customers that you've named are paying today. It's a lot, yeah. so. Corky, I'm gonna give you the last word before we hand it back to our chair to let us resume, resume. Re, what do you call it? Adjourn. <laughs> We're gonna adjourn this meeting at some point. Go ahead, Corky. Just a couple of quick general comments. Uh, it's <laughs> encouraging to hear the connection with the current offsite stormwater fees. I think that's the sort of thing we really need to, to convey to the public. You're, you're gonna save over here, you're gonna pay more over there. Uh, the other thing is when we talk about insurance, and I, I suspect Colin and Evan are already dusting off the talking points from a few years ago, uh, it's a real easy case. Milton Freewater is a classic example of where they said, well, you know, we just go our own way. We don't need recertification. We don't need all this other stuff. And then within a few short years, they said, whoops, 
you know, that didn't work, you know. So uh, there's a real easy case to be made there. I think we can do that. But my caution is, as we do all this, let's just be really careful and really honest with ourselves. It's easy to say the path forward is cheaper than an alternative, such as what happened in Milton Prewater. But we also need to answer the basic questions of what am I getting for this money? And perhaps most embarrassingly right now is why this increase? So let's not forget those as we yeah. go forward with saying, hey, this is still cheaper. That's, that is a good concluding statement, Corky, and a good complimentary contrast to Nancy's statement. We have a lot of different baselines to work from here. Yeah, she's yeah. giving you a heart. I know he's not really disagreeing with you, there are a lot of ways of defining baseline in this situation, right? But and cheaper cheaper than a bad alternative is not the goal. <laughs> cheaper, <laughs> right. cheaper than complete disaster. Right. <laughs> we we can right. do better. We should Mr. Do better. Chair, your team has performed admirably today. I'm gonna hand we, it back to you. Yeah, thank happy. you, everyone. This was really thoughtful. I know we talked at you a lot. I hope the process piece gives you some hope that we have it at least broadly mapped out. And again. I really appreciate this feedback. We look forward to improving the draft products that we gave you. So I'll stop talking now. Thanks, Jim. Um, thanks to everybody. Appreciate staff, appreciate you board members. Thank you, Sarah, for the facilitation. Um, we will see you next time. Meeting adjourned. Thank you guys so much. We'll see you thanks, on the 15th everyone. for the next board meeting. Take care.